Hi everyone, um, thanks for joining us today. I'm Will Dave Rosnan and I work in the School Attendance Policy Team here in the department. This is the last in our current series of best practice webinars and today we're hearing from Bromley Trust Academy which is an alternative provision setting. We're joined by Neil Miller who is the Deputy CEO of the Trust and we're also joined by Rob Freeman who's Head of School and Myra Brown who's Head of Attendance at the Academy. Uh, we'll be putting questions to Neil, Rob and Myra at the end of the presentation, so please submit any questions using the tab on the right hand side of your screen. Separately, as I'm sure everyone will already have seen, last week um, we published new attendance guidance which summarises um, the roles, responsibilities and expectations of schools, trusts and local authorities. And the expectations um, in that guidance will apply from this September. And if you hadn't seen, um, we're also running a session the same time next week about what this guidance means in particular for schools. And that's intended to answer any questions that, that people on this call might have. Um, so we would encourage you to sign up for that webinar if you haven't already done so. We've also got a number of thematic um, webinars planned, which will pick up specific elements of, of that new guidance. And we're getting a number of schools and trusts to talk in detail about what they do um, for that series. And just a note to say, um, as with, uh, with this webinar that's recorded, all the previous webinars that we've run have been recorded too, and they're available online and should be at the links um, on the right hand side of your screen. At the end of the webinar, if you can remember to submit your feedback to us to let us know what you thought of this presentation, that would be would be really appreciated. And in fact, if there are specific aspects of the new guidance that you would like to see us cover in more detail, please um, put that in the feedback as well. That, I think, is everything that I wanted to say by way of introduction. So I'll hand over now um, to Neil, who's going to talk about the context um, of the trust in the first instance. Thanks, Neil. Thank you, William, um, and, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, as William said, I'm, I'm the, the Deputy CEO of London South East Academies Trust, and Bromley Trust Academy is one of eight provision schools within our trust. I'm joined this afternoon by Rob Freeman, and, and he's actually co-head teacher of Bromley Academy Trust, um, and, and Myra Brown is actually head of Key Stage 4 and head of attendance. So um, they, they're going to be the ones giving you the detail um, about what Bromley Trust Academy do and, and the work that they do on a day to day basis in, in regards to attendance. But I felt it, it, it important to actually give you an overview of our trust um, initially um, be, before we actually go in, into the nitty gritty of, of attendance. So if we could move on two slides, please. So our trust initially um, is made up of eight schools, um, different types of schools, APs, SEN schools and, and mainstream schools. And we're part of a, a large organisation, London South East Education Group, um, which is made up of four FE colleges, FE, HE colleges um, in South East London, which is Bromley, Alpinton, Bexley and Greenwich colleges. Um, and, and, and our eight schools, which forms that larger, larger group. The trust was actually formed in 2014 by Bromley College at that time and the Bromley Local Authority. And the reason why um, the Bromley Local Authority came to Bromley College and asked them to sponsor the local authority PRU was because it was seen that the vast majority of students in year 11 at the PRU were going to the college um, but by October half term, they'd all dropped out. Um, so they felt it absolutely vital that there was this closer synergy in terms of the PRU and the college and how it would work. So in 2014, the trust was created um, and the PRU was actually the first school within the trust. Um, and it's an all through organisation from, from five to, to 16. Um, and then other schools joined. So in terms of the context of our schools, we've got five special schools, one all through SEMH, five to 18, two primary SEMH schools, one secondary SEMH school, and one all through ASC school. We've got two all through PRUs from five to 16, and we've got one large mainstream school, 
with uh, an ARP for visual impairment. As well as the eight schools, we've also we're also extremely lucky to have Bexley Music Service join us a year today, um, which actually provides uh, the, the the music service for Bexley, but also we're we're trying to utilise this across uh, our trust wider still. Um, what what we want to be able to do is, is basically demonstrate our social values in our school or, or our mission and vision within our schools. And actually, in terms of promoting excellence, we've had three inspections this year in three of our schools, and all those schools have kept their good or outstanding category labels. Um, and, and, and I believe that the presentation that's going to be provided to you today from Myra and, and Rob actually demonstrates uh, our, our mission and vision very clearly in terms of the high expectations and, 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 and levels of hard work and personal development and achievement, but also the social value that we emphasise within our local communities and, and the drive that we have to, to not only support our students, but also their parents and families to actually ensure better outcomes for, for our, our children and young people across all of our schools. We can move on to the next slide. And this this is basically the geography of our trust at this moment in time. We've got, as I said, the, the, the different schools. You've got Bramley Oak, which is a primary SEMH school in Surrey, and that's the, the most recent school to join us under an academy order. Um, and and th the other schools that are situated in Bromley and Bexley, as named there, you can see Bromley Trust is, is the Pro, Bromley Beacon, is the all through SEMH in Bromley, and then you have an Endeavour, which is the secondary SEMH, Aspire, which is the primary SEMH, Belmont, which is the mainstream primary, Horizons, which is the all through Peru in Bexley, and Woodside, which is the all through um, ASC. So I think that's really important to understand the context of the trust initially to then ensure that when Rob and Myra are talking about the school, you, you know that they are supported by a, a considerably larger organisation. To, to ensure that, that, that the best outcomes possible are provided. And on that note, I'm going to hand over to the guys that do the work on the ground. Oh, can I please have the next slide, please? Thank you, Neil. All right, so um, as Neil said, Bromley Trust Academy is a uh, alternative provision. It's based in Bromley and our places are commissioned by the local authority and we take pupils from reception all the way up to Key Stage 4. Any school in Bromley is able to refer pupils to the local authority uh, for additional support at something that's called the Gateway Panel, and this consists of Bromley professionals. It's only after um, there's been extensive support and services in place to try and keep children in school would place actually be offered in one of our provisions. At primary, most of the pupils are already under statutory assessment for their special educational needs, which are predominantly around SCMH. Uh, if they're not already under assessment when they're joining us, that process will start off. And at primary, they stay in the provision until a, uh, the correct onward provision to meet their needs can be found for them to move on to. But secondary, the story is a bit different because the route is predominantly through exclusions um, rather than this gateway process. If it's appropriate, pupils can return to uh, a mainstream setting through FAP. At key stage four, though, unfortunately, this is less likely. And Bromley itself is the largest uh, borough, so this can really impact on pupils who have to attend. Um, but thankfully, again, at primary, we're supported by the local authority who do put transport in place where it's needed for those particular children. Right, and the table that we've got on the slide there is just to kind of show what our cohort is for this year. Now, if we can move on to the next slide. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so this next slide, some of you may be familiar with the table that has been put up. Um, it is um, the national absence rates for pupil referral units in England. Um, and we do refer back to this quite regularly um, to enable us um, to continue to drive forward with improving. Our aspirational attendance for our trust is going to be always the, the government minimum. We want to get to that 95%, but we obviously recognise that there are many, many barriers um, in our way to get there. 
but this provides us with really good information because it's comparing us to other um, alternative provisions that are facing those same or similar um, barriers. Next slide, please. So our attendance journey. So as Rob's already said, part of that journey is the barrier of the size of the local authority that we live in. And some of our students, especially at Key Stage 4, have very, very long journeys. <clears throat> Many of our students um, have either um, refused to attend their previous provisions. Um, I've had extremely low attendance um, and have been put on actually very reduced timetables. When they come to us, um, they come into us through our assessment and transition centre and that's where we start to get to know our young people um, without the pressures of entering a classroom full of others and it's here that we get an awful lot of our baseline data for that young person. Persistent absentees, um, that is the starting point, will be their attendance upon our arrival and we monitor and we track that from the very very beginning and it's rag rated because we want to alert ourselves and alarm ourselves to, to drive harder and to do more for that young person. On our tracker, which is viewable for all members of staff, we have all the interventions that we're putting in place, any interventions that we've referred into that we're waiting for, and actually it's reviewed regularly. It, it can't just be left. It's a continuous review process to ensure that we've covered every, every aspect that we can, and sometimes you really do have to think outside the box for our young people. Students may come to us in the very beginning and have a personalised timetable, a slightly shorter school day, and that is because they could have come um, from being under elective home education or just not attending a school at all, and they've lost all faith in education. So to put them into another setting full time would actually be um, quite detrimental. So we bring them in and we build them up, but very quickly. And that's not all of our students. Some of our students do come in on a full time table. So we don't use a personalised timetable to resolve an attendance issue either. And because it, it, it's going to set that young person up to fail at some point down the line in their futures. So at key stage one and two, sometimes there are transportation problems and we will implement a personalised timetable until we get that sorted out. But it's not a permanent solution. In, in our mainstream environment, we're always striving to keep our young people up full time because that's how we're going to achieve those outcomes for them at the end of Key Stage 4. Next slide, please. So as you can see up on the screen is our uh, overall attendance over the last uh, five years. We have actually been tracking since we came under the trust since 2013-14 uh, academic year. Um, but for the purpose of this today, we've just covered the last five years. And you can see that we have brought ourselves up to quite a consistent percentage across those years, including over the COVID um, period as well. Um, and obviously that is slightly adjusted because we went to remote learning and there were periods of school closure. So our attendance journey is we're regularly sitting there, but we have periods of the year where we are much higher than that. And, and quite often it's when you start to have those exclusions coming in from schools that you will see your attendance dip. And of course, your cohort size as well is a massive impact on a percentage attendance. Next slide, please. So it's going back to this table that you can find on the .gov website. And actually, you can use this table to um, play around and create your own data that you want from it. It's quite a useful tool again, and you will see on this, and I'm just going to put my glasses on, sorry everybody, um, to how we compare within that. And, and the cohort size is quite crucial again. So we're very much fluctuating, and I'm sure you all suffer with the same thing. You never know, You're, we're rolling cohorts. You don't know who's going to be permanently excluded, who's going to be referred to you by the local authority um, through the gateway process or the fair access panel. So percentages are, 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 can sometimes um, paint a very different picture to what's actually going on in, in the school. So at the moment, the Romney Trust Academy um, is quite competitive in, in our attendance against everybody else. And even with um, our BT at the 50% persistent absentee at the bottom, that bottom run, we can generally track that back and that will mainly be all of our students that are either on a child protection plan or actually are looked after. 
Um, and so actually we're keeping that to quite to quite a minimum number and the data for this year isn't out yet, but obviously across the country it's quite high data. Next slide, please. So Right, okay, so, <laughs> right, what are the barriers to student attendance? Now, a large part of our work at BT is looking around at breaking down barriers and trying to take a holistic approach to what we do. So we don't just look at behaviour, we don't just look at attendance, we look at the causes behind it. Um, we always try to follow attendance isn't actually the problem, that's the symptom, right? It's the result of other factors that drive this. So what can we actually do to unpick those barriers so that we don't have poor attendance? Um, one of the biggest barriers we find in school is uh, around pupils uh, participating is that they don't always understand what they're asked to do in around the learning. Are they able to access the work? So that's the last thing we try and break down. Um, I put on my notes here that you can also have children not attending school but you can also have children not attending in school. So by this, I mean, do you ever have times where you have children who are in school, but they're missing from certain lessons? Because if so, that is part of the big barrier as well that you might have to think about. Um, if a student wasn't attending, these are some of the questions on the screen that we would be asking, and we'd be looking at what additional support we could put in place. So if it was anxiety or mental health issues, we'd be working with our therapy team, we might be working with agencies such as CAB to try and help support that. And uh, the bottom point in bold there, I'll, I'll put, um, other than having bills to pay, ask yourself the question, like, why do you go to work every day? Is it because you feel successful? Do you feel safe? Do you feel valued? Are you achieving? These are the same questions you should be asking our children, because I don't think as adults we will be going every day if we didn't feel that way. Next slide, please. Now we have um, a culture that sets out very high expectations and this is based around our school values. This underpins everything we're trying to achieve and it spells out the word decide because we like to emphasise to our children you've always got a choice in what you do. You might not always like the choices but you do still have a choice. In terms of discovery, the question I always ask the children say to them is well why get out of bed if you're not going to go and try and learn or do something new that day? You've got one life to so make the most of it. In Endeavour, it doesn't matter what you do, just give it your best shot. Community, well, this, this is really important to make sure our children feel safe and feel part of the community. Independence is about the children thinking for themselves, giving it a go before asking for help. Decisions is around them owning their choices. Then every day it says it at the bottom there. This is really important for us. Be in school every day. Try and push through on those days, even when you don't feel like it. Be there. These values we say are for the children, but they're for our adults as well. So uh, next slide, please. And again, about fostering this whole school culture of high expectations. I've just got the word relationships, 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 because that is what underpins everything we do. It's the biggest thing we do. We know our children very, very well. We do have an advantage because we are relatively small provisions, but we use it to our advantage to make sure that we know what's going on for these, our children, what's happening in their lives, what the difficulties are, what their family structures are like, what lessons do they like, what are they interested in, and we know what our children can and can't do. This means we know when we can uh, stretch and challenge them with their work or try and push them in certain activities. I also know when we need to provide extra support or interventions. We want our children to actually make mistakes because mistakes aren't mistakes, they're learning opportunities. We always talk about understanding and acceptable, so not just in terms of behaviour, it can account for attendance as well, so we can understand why you might not be in school, but it's not acceptable, you need to be there every day trying to work to our values. The whole culture of the school is focused around children feeling safe enough to be stretched and challenged. And if a child isn't in school, we want to know why and actually staff are upset that they're not in because they know that child's then missing out. Every day there will be a call home trying to find out where that particular child is. Um, from our feedback from the pupils, parents, it's always very positive. They're always talking about how they feel supported by staff in school and that they recognise their effort and progress is better when they actually attend our provision. Uh, 
Um, but again, for some of our pupils, this is what they need. They need that security of a small setting. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. So what do we do to support attendance? Um, well, we need to make sure that, first of all, our schools are safe learning environments. Um, and especially um, and more so at key stage uh, three and four, where our young people are freer to um, do and, and be involved in activities within the community that are perhaps unsafe. Um, so we have a policy of searching. So when our students come on site, every student is searched and all their personal items are removed and stored securely in um, bags and uh, drawers that are named and labelled for those young people. So everybody's treated exactly the same. It's a level playing field and everybody knows that they are safe in our buildings. And that, I think, is the very first step to supporting uh, good and improved attendance. Telephone calls. You know, when a child's not in school, it's it's not OK just to um, make the one call and log that that parent didn't answer or it was engaged or I've left a voicemail message. It is about the pursuit of making those calls throughout the day. And we know that can be very challenging time wise and with staffing personnel. But it's about safeguarding those young people as well and, and attendance and safeguarding are in partnership. So we must continue and make contact with that parent. Emails. We also will send an email, but those emails have to be personalised. Um, in, in the environments we work in, to have a generic email, a, a parent will just dismiss it. Personalising it, knowing that family, being able to make reference to something that has gone on recently for that young person or their, their wider family is crucial in that parent wanting to communicate back with us. Again, a lot of our students um, are not always permanently excluded. Um, some of them have come to us via the respite um, process through our local authority and, and it's continued the, the partnership and working with those schools that they are actually registered with as a single registration and their dual registration with us. That's quite crucial that they know that there's a community around them. So if that child was to return to their mainstream school, that same level of intervention and wanting to know that young person and the difficulties they're facing is, is where it's going to make a successful uh, transition back into that school. Partnerships with agencies, and I'm sure many, many of you will be working with all the agencies that are listed on there at some point, but it, I can't stress enough how crucial it is to push to build those relationships. I'm part of the safeguarding team here as well, and we know all of our social workers very, very well. We strive to get to know them because then they're going to work for us and we're going to work for them. And that the centre of that is that young person and their family and their safety and well-being. Educational welfare. I don't see them as a service just to persecute a parent for their child's non-attendance. We should be building relationships with our educational welfare officers because they're the ones, if we can't get out to that young person, they can. and We can form that positive relationship there as well. Youth offending, which has obviously just recently changed its name to the Youth Justice Service. Again, it's, it's, it's very important for us at Key Stage 4 um to to understand when those when those are taking place when our young people have actually come under the youth offending team when their sessions are going to be feeding back to that youth um worker that they're with about how they're doing at school because they again that child knows that everybody's got an interest in them and how they're doing and performing and you can also tap into things that they may have on offer that can also be a great intervention for that young person especially when we've got the school holidays and the structure of school is no longer there for that young person. Substance misuse um, for the young person and their parents, being able to signpost them in the direction of services and support for the families is absolutely crucial. And there's many, many ways of doing that. It's not just that telephone call, it's leaflets, it's information on the back of letters going out that we do as well. And that's one of the things when we come down to our letters, any letters about attendance that go out on the back, uh, there is a grid where we're advising that parent of where their child's attendance is possibly sitting. If you have so many days out, your attendance is never going to rise above that percentage um, and, and what their outcomes can be with it. Um, home visits. That again is about knowing your families and knowing when to go. It's not OK just to go out at nine o'clock in the morning or, you know, sometimes you've, you've got to be able to be flexible and move it around and visit those families. I wouldn't recommend 
either working outside of working hours, but sometimes there is the need to perhaps be doing one later on in the day. Um, we also use punctuality and attendance contracts, and that's normally at the low level when you're starting to see a young person dip away from that golden 90%, and often that is used in partnership with the Common Assessment Framework, otherwise known as CAFs. And I am aware that not an awful lot of local authorities still use that process, but we do in Bromley, and it is, a, it is quite a useful um, framework um, for us to start bringing that uh, other agency support in around that family. We are very quick to make referrals to agencies that we think we're in need and to push for those referrals and to push to get our young people as near to the top of those very long waiting lists at the moment. But it's about being able to identify what the most appropriate service is for that young person and how it's going to fit best with how they're doing in school. Next slide, please. So when I said earlier on that we our students when they come to us will go into our we call it the ATC our assessment and transition area um, it is about starting to get to know that young person without putting the pressure of them of performing academically um, in the main classroom environment and we have lots of baseline tests and I'm sure some of you will recognize some of those and some of you may use some slightly different tests but it's about identifying their learning needs and styles to provide all teaching staff and support staff within the school their initial starting points. One of the biggest and most crucial things is the reading age and the reading ability of our young people and we really embrace that within our trust. We have dear time which stands for drop everything and read and we have it at strategic points throughout the week and they do it with the teachers it's not outside of their school hours it's done halfway through a lesson or at the start or in tutor time and everybody's doing the same thing. They're picking up their reading book and they're reading, and that includes the staff. And the staff regularly publish what books we're currently reading and where we're at with it, so that reading becomes um, more mainstream for our young people. Salt, speech and language um, is absolutely crucial. An awful lot of our young people come um, through into our service and they have um, many areas that are flagged um, under the salt testing. Um, and it's about understanding where their um, problems lie. Some of them, it, it's, it's numerical. Some of them, obviously, it's dyslexia and reading. It can also be things like their processing. Um, and it's those observations that we can provide with our staff pretty much within the first few weeks of them starting. We'll do the observations, but then um, we may then identify that a student needs to have um, an actual screen and an assessment by the SALT team. And we can also tap into SALT via the Youth Offending Service as well. So it's about knowing what your agencies have got on offer and being able to get the best interventions as quickly as possible for our young people. We, we have a staff member that is qualified to do the dyslexia screening and all of our students will go through a screening. Sometimes that doesn't throw up any dyslexia traits, but actually we can find out actually there might be eyesight problems and opticians may be required and things like that because we're looking at the font size they're using. Um, all staff, and that includes all the support staff, and even if you're administrative, you'll be provided with the basic learning styles and um, aids and interventions that that young person needs. And this is all copied into the seating plans, and this is where teaching and learning becomes an integral part of how we improve attendance. It's not standalone. Attendance has to be in partnership with safeguarding and with teaching and learning. If we're getting the children in, we need to want them to come back in. And that's where the, te the good teaching and learning comes in. When we've got them in, we can safeguard them. We can start to look into what else they need outside of school and in their community to keep them safe. As I said before, all previous attendance is used as baseline and we rag rate it. And um, I was once asked by um, an Austin inspector, why did I rag rate it um, and, and make it look glaringly red in some areas? And I said, that's the drive, that, that's the ambition and that's the alert to me to say there's more that needs to be done. It isn't OK just to accept the fact that young person's at 75 percent. We shouldn't be asking for more. We should still be looking to find out how we can improve that because improved attendance, as we know, helps to improve outcomes for that young person moving on. Um, as I said before, um, we also, on top of that um, tracking persistent absenteeism, we also look at targeted students. So depending on the cohort size, currently at the moment with my cohort size, I have got 10 top 10 targeted students 
that I am literally looking at every single day, seeing if they're in, how their day's been in school, what their behaviour log looks like, because it's going to give me an indicator of whether tomorrow they're going to turn up, be late, be on time and have another good day. And that, again, is just really honing in. Have I got the right interventions? Have we put um, the right things in place for that young person? What have we missed? And quite often we will see within a term that one or two of those students will come off and I'll have maybe one or two more. But I will always have a minimum of 10 students that I'm focused and targeting. Going back to the contact um, in the previous slide about telephone calls and emails. We've all got different management systems um, and they're as good as, as the person that's been trained on them. And I know that the majority of them use um, the automatic uh, text and email systems. And that's really good, especially if you're pushed for time. You know that's gone out, you know you've alerted people. But please, you know, one of the things we have found is you must, must, must still make that personal phone call, make that personalised email. That's how you get your parents on board. That's how you can get your children on board. CPOMs, again, another safeguarding, as I said, everything goes hand in hand and attendance is safeguarding and safeguarding is attendance. Um, we um, use the CPOM system and for us that's crucial because as soon as that child comes, even if they're in the stages of where they're going to appeal um, and schools don't necessarily release all of their files, we can actually um, import in the chronology of their safeguarding. And again, that's, that's crucial for us to have an understanding of where we're going to go with attendance. Next slide. So how do we make the difference? Well, we think we've got the balance right between the quality of education we can provide, the, our therapeutic offer, and the rules, the routines, and the relationships that underpin this. Um, the, the little extra things we do are things like free breakfast for all of our children. Um, we're very lucky to be supported by a charity organisation called Magic Breakfast. All students are provided with a free school lunch, that's regardless of whether they're free school meals or not, because we know that could be a barrier to why someone's coming to school or not. Again, as we've said all through this, about building those positive relationships with parents, carers, as well as the pupils. It's about knowing these particular families, knowing the communities they've come from. Um, we do listen, we, we are, are empathetic, we try and provide solutions, we don't want to be additional barriers. But there does come a point where we do have to have the tough conversations as well. Um, yeah, so we are honest and clear about the next steps. If, if tenants isn't proven, then there are certain routes that we do have to go down and take those tough lines. And the important thing is to celebrate and reward progress, even the small steps, because for some of our children, these small steps are absolutely huge. Even them just coming into school, you know, for that first time is a huge, huge barrier that, that child's overcome. Then the last word I put on my notes here is we have time to deal with lots of these issues and they do take time, but it's worth working them through and taking that time to deal with them. Um, next slide, please. Hopefully we've made this point quite clear that you can't look at attendance in isolation. It's, it's only part of a much, much bigger picture. We have to do so much more across the school to get things right to make sure our children want to attend. So it is part of this whole school approach. As I said earlier, attendance is the symptom, right? There's always a reason why somebody's not going to attend. The big thing for us we've seen is that data doesn't always tell you the story because if you look at our attendance, it is below mainstream. You know, if you just saw the, you know, the 70% there, you wouldn't think that was particularly good. So it doesn't always tell that story. It doesn't tell you the improvement these children make because some of our children weren't attending at all. Right, relationships. Can't underestimate how important it is to have very, very good relationships with the people you're working with, the children you're working with, to make them want to be here. Then the last thing is in everything we do is we can understand why certain things happen, but there has to come a point where we say that's not acceptable. You know, and we always want to be best. Going back to Mara's point about the red, about driving us on yeah, and that's that's really it i think so yeah thank you i'll make the last slide excellent thank you very much rob and myra um i've got a few questions that have come in and a few um 
from me too actually just in listening to the presentation there's a one that's come in which we'll deal with first which hopefully is an easy one um which was just a specific question about who makes your first day absence calls is it the attendance officer or is it someone else within your school so it in the main part it is our attendance officer um, if that call hasn't gone through and that person is not then available, then it's picked up by somebody else. There is a team of us in attendance and that includes all staff in the building. So, you, you as I said, attendance is not in isolation um, and everybody has to pick up on it. Form tutors have to, is that, the, you know, their tutees, they want them in school. The teachers, the subject teachers, they want them in school. So absolutely it would be our attendance officer that makes that first call. But that doesn't mean to say that's the only person that will make attendance calls. Thanks, Myra. Um, I thought it was really striking the number of agencies and services that you um, discussed on a previous slide. And I wondered if, you, if there's any more that you could say actually about how you built relationships in particular um, with those with those services and, and, and advice that you might have for people looking to kind of establish strong working relationships with with those yeah, external teams. You have, you just, I'm, I'm just looking at someone, you just have to be relentless. These, these, these agents, you know, agencies, everybody's there, they've all got their own limit, they're all very, very busy, nobody's got enough hours in the day. Um, and, it, and it is just about not letting them get away from you. Um, and I, I am a little bit, for want of a better phrase, I'm like a dog with a bone. If, if I want interaction with that particular agency, you know, you've know, just got to find a way of getting into them. Um, and at the end of the day, they're all there to work for that young person. So actually, what is it I can offer them as well? So if I'm offering them the opportunity to come into school because that child hasn't been down to their YOS appointment or they they haven't been in to um, visit Salt or the Phoenix Centre or or wherever it is, the, you know, the paediatric teams, then then let them come into us if it's appropriate. I mean, obviously that changed slightly over COVID, but we, we've all got to have open doors to one another because it's about a working partnership. Excellent, thank you. Um, and you touched briefly on um, both of you the importance of st establishing really strong working relationships with with the families of um, of the children that go to your schools. I wondered if you if you could say anything about situations in which yeah you've had to have some of those more challenging conversations and, and what that kind of looks like and how you go about that. Um, well, I can think there's one very recently we've had where um, the child's not been attending, so we've worked with Bromley Children's Project and the tough conversations then have to go, if this uh, continues, then we may have to go further down the, the safeguarding kind of route and see if we can escalate it up to a chin, um, because the uh, it's not the pupil's fault that they're not in school, it's the parent who's not actually parenting them and getting them in, so that was quite a, a difficult and challenging conversation. I can say that the pupil's been in for the last few weeks since then, so it has had an impact. There's a few um, questions that are coming in here. Um, one which is about um, what your staff staff to student ratios are like and the capacity within your school that somebody's wondering about. Yeah, how many staff to, per pupil that typically you have within the school? Um, well, we're a rolling cohort. So that's going to vary throughout the year and from year to year as well. So it's 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 quite challenging. So uh, uh, primary school. So well, primary, we're about 10 or 11 in the class. There's a teacher and an additional uh, adult in the class. Then there are some additional adults around the building as well. And and I think on the, on the, on the um the key stage three and four site, I think we're at a ratio of about one to four, one to five. But that includes when we're when we're counting staff, we're not just counting teaching staff. Every every staff member contributes to that child's day in school. That doesn't matter whether you're on reception, whether you're you're you know the, the senko, the it, it doesn't matter. So yeah, we're we're not not really tight, but it's you know. Uh, can, can, can I come in there as well, please, please Liam? Because I, I would say that, like every um, school, um, our, our schools are facing cuts, um, significant cuts, um, budget cuts. For me now, our budget, um, we, we, we're lucky in one sense that we've got a funding contract with the local authority for BTA for five years, you know, which is in, in AP terms really good because it provides you with that financial stability and, and, and understanding and budget planning. However, 
you know, the the high needs budget in Bromley, like every other borough in the in the in the in the country, is strained um, and and struggling. Um, so we we we've been cut financially over over time. The cuts haven't been dramatic, and I think one of the reasons for that is because the the school does an amazing job, and I think the the local authority recognise that. But they've also used you moved down money around to actually put more money into outreach um, and actually reduce the provision uh, of numbers overall, which, you know, is, is the way of the white paper. But in terms of our staffing, I would say we are fully stretched in terms of our staffing loads now across our schools and and the thought of trying to, to reduce it more with the complexity of the young people that are coming in now. Um, and that's, I think, COVID related. Actually, the the, the cohort is changing. Um, when I speak to, to the heads, and Rob and, 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 and to Julie, who's the, the head of the secondary provision, the cohorts are changing in terms of what they look like and the complexities they, they've got are greater. And yet, actually, we're, we're asking staff to do more and, 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 and the staffing numbers are reducing over time. And I can imagine everyone, if they're sitting here from AP, are probably in a very similar position. But as I say, we're in a very lucky position because Bromley have actually given us a five year funding contract, which, you know, in terms of stability helps greatly. Thanks for that, Neil. Um, I think we've got time for about two or so more questions. There's one in um, that's just come in, um, Myra. I don't know if there's more that you want to say, but um, somebody has said that they have great difficulty engaging their education welfare officers. And they've got they're taking children from lots of different local authorities. And if the, if you've got any tips um, on that front, <laughs> yeah, it, it is hard, isn't it? Because some people you're going to be able to build a rapport with very very quickly, and, and others not. I suppose I'm I'm quite a gregarious person, and I like networking and socialising. What can I say? Um, I, I I just keep going until I find something that I think will click with that person. I, I think one of the benefits I've had is that before COVID, you mainly spoke to your ERO via email or on a telephone call if you were lucky. With the moving forward to Teams and Zoom for meetings, actually, I you know I, I just picked up on body language and you is it, just working very hard and actually putting your roles aside and getting to know that person and then bringing the roles back in and how am I going to get that to work for me. Um, I do an awful lot for our young people without persecuting the parents. Um, I, I, will, I will log with my ERO that I've got a concern about a particular family that I'm currently working with them but it won't be very long before I'm going to be wanting them to step up and do some work with us. They'll, she'll put them on the list and they're going out at the moment in Bromley and they're doing targeted hits in local areas for attendance for all schools. And actually, as a result of that, our families then are seeing it as, oh, they've picked us up because our child's been picked up in the street and, and that's why. And actually, I need to step up and start working with the school. So there's, it's, it's about thinking outside the box, I think, with, for everybody um, and, and just working hard. It is just that relentless hard work. Can, can I jump in again, William? Um, yeah, please do. I mean, something that I think our relationship with multi-agencies um, previously weren't so good, um, and that was because of the poor quality provision. So they didn't actually have um, the same sort of trust and, and belief in what we did. And also the fact is when um, we're not getting responses from multi-agency groups, actually escalate um, and put pressure on them. They'll be quick to escalate for us if we didn't do our job properly. And I think it works in in, 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 in the same way back. And, and and I know when we took on um, our schools in Bromley initially, both were, were failing provision. And actually, um, in terms of relationships with the, the, the local authority, wasn't that great at times um, and multi-agency working. But we, we sort of escalated and, 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 and put things to DCS and people like that within the local authorities. And when you're quoting safeguarding, they're, they're going to respond, aren't they? And I think when you're working with that person who's, who's got multiple local authorities, it's so much harder. Um, but I think you've just got to have that same consistency and approach in terms of how you deal with each local authority. Um, and if the local authority don't work in the same way, 
then you simply escalate. And, and I've found in recent times, quoting one local authority against another works an absolute treat because they don't want to be outdone by the neighbour. So, you know, I, I, and, and that's worked really well in, in a couple of occasions recently. Thanks for that, Neil. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end maybe with a with a question that I hope doesn't open up too many more other questions. But um, you talked a lot about the systems and the processes and the culture. I wonder if there was anything that you wanted to say about actually the curriculum offer within the school. Any more to say about that and, and how you designed that to make it engaging and, and attractive for, for your young people? Okay, yeah, um, we uh, follow as full of curriculum as we can. So. Um, at primary, we do have a very, very large focus on uh, reading, writing and numeracy because we want to try and fill in those gaps because that is where the uh, biggest difficulties have been for the children. So um, we then also try and pick up on the social experiences for them because they're large parts that they've missed out on. At secondary, they get a, a very good offer. Don't they, so. Yeah, we um, at Bromley Trust Academy and the secondary provision, um, we deliver GCSEs. Um, we have high aspirations for our students. Our students may have had barriers to attendance and to their education before, and they may well need lots of intervention to aid them with their learning and progression. But it doesn't mean to say we can't set the bar high. You set the bar high for the individual um, and you show them the clear scaffolding and steps around it to get there. So we offer a GCSE package. Um, it is limited, of course it is, but then it's about engaging them and showing them that the skills they learn from that subject, the pathways it takes them further on. And, and you may not be an artist, but actually where are the skills you're going to learn in art? Where can that actually take you? It's not going to stop you from moving on to college. It's not going to stop you moving on from your apprenticeship and future employment. It's about the skills you learn rather than the subject you study that is the real important thing when you've got a child that is struggling with the learning and struggling with the subjects on offer. And I think with um, pretty much every child that comes into our provision, they say to us one of the first things is, I don't read, I don't write, I don't do this. And we're like, uh, you will, but we're going to help you do that. Can, can I also come in there? I, th I think in terms of our, our expectations, we expect every young person to leave our Key Stage 4 provision with a maths and English qualification. Um, and, you know, for this year, for instance, at the moment, we've got 53% of our young people um, passing level two um, functional skills in English and maths. So, you know, when I'm when that that then provides them with the, 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 the next steps in terms of college. And because we actually have obviously part of the college group um, and we work closely with the college, we've got 0% percent neat um, for a number of years now in terms of um, students moving on to college and the transitions are really supportive and, and, and our careers lead works really closely with the college to ensure that they, they move on to the, to the correct pathway. The vast majority of our young people leave with at least five qualifications. Um, and, you know, pre-COVID, yeah, I think it was about 40% that were leaving with five, four to nine, including English and maths. Um, you know, so for us, we, we really do drive expectations and, and, and we want every young person to leave with the, 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 the qualifications that are appropriate to, for their next steps. And I, and I think that's really important. And, and having those high expectations, they know they're coming to, to, to school to learn. They know they're gonna get quality first teaching, but they know they're coming to learn. They're not coming to, to have a jolly up, they're coming to learn and, and, and work hard for the six hours that they're in school. Thanks, Neil. I think maybe that's um a good time to call the presentation in this webinar to a close so thanks to everyone who's um joined thanks neil myra and rob for the um excellent and very clear presentation in particular but that was really really um yeah really clear account of um of what you do as a as a school and as a as a setting so thank you for that and as I said at the beginning, if anybody would like to join the session next Thursday, it will be the same time. The registration link should be in the sidebar on the right hand side for you to sign up to that. And we'll be publicising the next series of thematic webinars, which will be picking different elements of the new attendance guidance and, and um, looking in detail at those, which will be later in June time. So thanks everyone for joining and thanks to um, Neil, Rob and Myra.